Uh, so it's really our pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, this is a topic that both Dr. Allen and I are very passionate about and, and keen, keen to talk about. Um, you know, these are, are common disorders in, in an outpatient neurology clinic. Um, and there are, you know, few of us, we're few and far between um, odo, odo neurologists. And so we're, we're, it's our pleasure today to, uh, to talk about this, uh, to use a case-based approach, uh, and to hopefully give people a framework, um, framework uh, in the clinic. So our objectives today, um, we're planning to review common presentations of imbalance, uh, you know, those things that present to an outpatient neurology clinic, uh, using a practical case-based approach. Um, we want to contrast key localizations for imbalance, including brain, visual system, inner ear or vestibular, uh, and peripheral nerve or proprioceptive problems. Um, and we want to give a framework as well as useful questions to, um, to ask patients. So we practice in a setting where pretty much our day-to-day -day is dizziness, vertigo. Um, we see dizzy and balanced patients all day, every day. And sort of the overall approach when we see a patient who has dizziness uh, is to think about the, the time course. You know, is the presentation acute and continuous vertigo? Um, if it is acute and continuous, uh, things that we want to think about are vestibular neuritis, stroke, uh, possibly a first presentation of migraine or Meniere's disease. If the presentation is episodic, uh, you know, we want to think about things like BPPV, orthostatic hypotension. And if the presentation is more subacute or chronic, we want to think about things like ataxias, uh, untreated recurrent BPPV, or other causes of, of chronic dizziness. And today we're going to be focusing really on that subacute chronic window. Um, and, you know, specifically, we want to talk about things that, you know, patients have that, that are going on in the subacute chronic uh, period. Uh, because there's a lot out there in the literature about acute and episodic uh, and less, less emphasis we feel in, in resident education on some of these subacute and, and chronic conditions. So that's going to be our focus today, uh, also because the, uh, the topic was, was balanced disorders. So vestibular symptoms, these are symptoms of vertigo, which includes a false sense of motion, uh, nausea, as well as head motion intolerance. So when you hear these symptoms in your clinic, you want to be thinking about potentially a vestibular cause. One point that we really want to emphasize is that we shouldn't focus too heavily on the quality of the symptoms. Um, we know there's good evidence now to show that patients who have, for example, orthostatic hypotension or anemia or a medical cause for their dizziness could well complain of of vertigo or a false sense of motion. And similarly, patients with vestibular problems, whether that's an inner ear problem like vestibular neuritis or a stroke, may describe orthostatic type symptoms. They may not clearly describe a false sense of motion. But when you see these symptoms, you know, vertigo, nausea, and particularly head motion intolerance, you want to at least be clued into the possibility that your patient might have a vestibular cause for their symptoms. Sometimes, though, patients only pre present with imbalance, not necessarily with dizziness or vertigo. And particularly patients who have more chronic problems, uh, you know, may have had a vestibular issue that has then chronified or may have a cerebellar issue. The story that you might get may be more about imbalance, and they may not necessarily describe dizziness uh, and vertigo. And so, um, you know, we want you to think about vestibular problems, uh, even when your patient is presenting with imbalance uh, and not necessarily a feeling like the room is spinning or, or a feeling of dizziness or vertigo. And so patients with imbalance might tell you a couple of things. They might tell you that they feel unsteady or hesitant when they're walking. They or their loved ones might complain that they veer to one side. They might tell you like they feel like they do after they've consumed alcohol, for example. The complaint might be of frequent falls um, without another cause, without a clear orthopedic or, or, or mechanical cause. Um, and particularly with vestibular problems, uh, they might tell you that they have more trouble on unsteady ground. So for example, more difficulty walking on, on cobblestone uh, streets. 
So if we take a step back and think about our vestibular system, it's really quite amazing what our vestibular system has to be able to do. If you think of the example of someone, you know, walking across Niagara Falls, for example, on a, on a tightrope uh, or having to balance something heavy or cumbersome uh, on, on their head, uh, really our vestibular system has to account for really, you know, hundreds of milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds changes in uh, terrain, in, you know, where our head is, where our body is. It has to be able to account for keeping our eyes steady when our head is being moved. Um, so it's really an evolutionarily old and fine-tuned system um, that is working all the time in the background to keep our, our balance. Uh, and it's something that we really, when it's working normally, we we take for, for granted um, because it does uh, such a seamless uh, and, and great job. So balance really needs the integration of a few different modalities. Uh, and there are three different modalities that we can use to, to keep our, our balance. So one of them, of course, is, is vision, uh, being able to see, um, very important one. Uh, vestibular, of course, or inner ear. Uh, so the way I describe it to patients is that, you know, inside each of our ears, one on either side, um, we have effectively an accelerometer and a gyroscope, uh, just like everyone has in, in, in their iPhone or in their smartphone. Um, and so we have three semicircular canals in each ear, um, as well as two um, sensors for linear translation, as well as head tilt. Um, so those systems are, of course, or that system is, of course, really important for balance. Um, and then we have proprioception as well. Uh, so our joint position sense, uh, knowing where, where our joints are in space. Um, and then all of these have to be integrated, um, and they're integrated in the brain. Um, and actually, more specifically, um, it's the cerebellum uh, that, that has this difficult task of, of integrating uh, these different modalities. And so really, if any of these modalities are, are affected, um, we're going to have difficulties with, with our balance. So there are some questions that are helpful at the bedside um, to determine you know, if, if there's a problem with balance, which system or systems might be uh, to blame or, or might, might be contributing. And so as far as vestibular uh, symptoms go, of course, we talked already about vestibular symptoms, uh, vertigo, uh, nausea, head motion intolerance. Of course, there are cases where, where these aren't present, particularly you know, in subacute or chronic cases. But things you can ask the patient, um, you know, if the patient has nystagmus or a two and four movement of the eyes, they might complain of, of oscillopsia. They might complain of seeing the world move in tandem with their nystagmus. Equally, if their visual and vestibular system isn't tightly linked, if their vestibular system can't keep their eyes steady, they might complain of the world moving when they're walking. And Dr. Allen's going to tell us a little bit more about oscillopsia uh, in a couple of slides. Um, another question that can be really helpful if you suspect a vestibular problem, particularly a vestibular problem on both sides, um, is whether the patient has difficulty reading signs in a moving car. And this can suggest that their vestibular system isn't steadying the eyes the way it should be. And so if they're trying to read something while their body is moving, their eyes aren't being kept steady. So those are some helpful questions uh, you know, to help disentangle or tease out a vestibular problem. On vision, uh, simply you can ask the patient if they complain of poor vision. Uh, is there possibly something in the history that might suggest cataracts, uh, poor vision uh, for any other reason? Uh, that certainly can be uh, contributing. It's one modality that, that when it's removed, uh, can contribute to imbalance. And then lastly, proprioception. Um, questions on history that can help you. Uh, are symptoms worse in the dark? Effectively, in a dark environment, sort of at night, you know, going to the bathroom, we're removing vision as one of the modalities that can help. So we're more dependent on proprioception, we're more dependent our, on our vestibular sense. And so if we're depending more on proprioception, symptoms might get worse in the dark when we remove vision. And then, of course, is there a known neuropathy? Uh, is there diabetes? Uh, do we already know that there might be, uh, on the history, a proprioceptive problem? So like Dr. Berry was talking about, um, imbalance 
itself is a subjective presenting symptoms. And there's different things that are non-vestibular that can also cause people to have this feeling of imbalance to keep in mind when seeing these patients. One of them is longstanding diabetes, because that can cause proprioception deficits. It can cause neuropathy as well as retinal disease. Another one is orthopedic issues like spinal stenosis, spinal stenosis, which can cause people to have a sense of imbalance. Autonomic disorders like orthostatic hypotension can cause people to feel very imbalanced. Polypharmacy, there's a lot of medications that can also cause orthostatic hypotension to keep in mind if people are on multiple of those medications. And then other medical disease, uh, Dr. Berry mentioned one, anemia is very common, cardiopulmonary, like arrhythmias, COPD, pulmonary hypertension. So we're going to start going through cases. Um, the first case is a 55-year-old man who presented with five years of imbalance and head movement-induced bouncing vision. So this is his viewpoint. Or walking. Oscillopsia. The illusion that the environment is moving when we move our heads is the characteristic visual symptom when vestibular function is lost. Oscillopsia often occurs when riding in a car, especially when the road is bumpy. This can make reading street signs difficult unless the car slows or stops. Oscillopsia also occurs when running or walking. Okay, so or walk. that is oscillopsia which is a visual sensation that a still image is moving. And when it's only present with movement, this is called walking oscillopsia. So on exam, this patient was found to have no spontaneous nystagmus, no gaze evoked nystagmus. And on head impulse testing, he was found to have bilateral catch-up saccades. He had 20-20 vision at baseline, but on dynamic visual acuity testing, he lost five lines of visual acuity in both horizontal and vertical planes. So his best was 2060 vision. He had a positive Romberg sign, which is when balance is worsened with eyes closed. And the rest of his neurologic exam was normal. Strength, sensation, and reflexes was normal. So here's his head impulse test. It might be slightly more obvious on left head turn, but you'll be able to see it much more clearly when uh, it's slowed down. So very obvious catch-ups I caught in both directions. Okay, and so this is dynamic visual acuity testing. T-Z-B-E-C-L. Good, now shake his head horizontally. So first he'll read the Snellen chart normally, and you'll, and you'll check his vision. Finally. And what's the lowest line you can read now? A-B-E-O-T-F. Now vertically. T-Z-B-E-C-L. So then um, what you do is you shake the person's head and you have them read the Snellen chart again. And normal people should not lose more than two lines of vision when doing this. And going back to his exam, he lost five lines of vision when doing this testing. So on further questioning, um, he was admitted to the hospital five years prior, immediately prior to symptom onset, at which time he was treated with gentamicin for endocarditis. Other testing that was done was that he had a normal audiogram, he had a normal contrasted MRI of his brain with internal auditory canal protocol, and he was diagnosed with vestibulotoxicity from gentamicin. So the management for this condition is uh, vestibular physical therapy to help compensate for the vestibular loss. So oscillopsia, walking oscillopsia is the illusory feeling of motion when walking or standing, not with sitting or lying, and it indicates a problem with the vestibular ocular reflex, most commonly from bilateral vestibular loss. And so sitting oscillopsia is the illusory feeling of motion when the head is still. 
And this is from spontaneous nystagmus. So the differential diagnosis for bilateral vestibular loss, um, going through our vitamins mnemonic to go through every topic, neurodegenerative is one of the big ones, multiple system atrophy or MSA, spinocerebellar ataxia, type three in particular, also another disease called canvas, cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, and vestibular areflexia syndrome, um, vascular causes like bilateral ICA strokes, which would be very unusual, superficial siderosis, and then toxic metabolic like vestibulo ototoxic medications, and also a common one is thiamine deficiency. Also, there's other infectious causes like meningitis, and there's malignant and perineoplastic causes like bilateral tumors, like bilateral vestibular schwannoma that we see in NF2, and also this antibody anti kelch 11 So in summarizing this case, uh, this patient presented with walking op opsilopsia, balance worse in darkness and uneven surfaces. He had no symptoms sitting or lying. On exam, he was found to have um, a bilateral abnormal head and pulse test. He had bilateral catch-up saccades. He had abnormal dynamic visual acuity. And again, dynamic visual acuity is another way to test the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Um, and he had a positive Romberg sign. So um, it's important to consider vestibular ototoxic med medications and also thiamine deficiency as some common causes of bilateral vestibular loss. So for workup for these patients, they should get formal vestibular testing and also a contrasted MRI brain with IAC protocol to rule out anything like bilateral tumors, like the bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Great, thanks, Dr. Allen. So we're now gonna transition to a second case. Um, so this is a 60-year-old female who presented with slowly progressive gait imbalance over the past four to five years. And so on exam, um, this is what you see. And so we can see that there's a rhythmic sort of a to and from to and fro movement of the eyes. And so that's what we call nystagmus. And so in, in the most common form of nystagmus, jerk nystagmus, uh, we really, we have two phases. There's a slow phase, which is the pathologic phase. Um, and that's the eye drifting uh, sort of off, off where it should. That's the pathologic phase. And then there's a quick movement to correct the eye. That's the eye coming back to where it should go. And so what we see here is a fast phase down. So this is what we call downbeat nystagmus. And so now we're just opening, opening the eye a little bit just to see what's happening when the patient's looking down. Um, maybe Dr. Allen, we can just play that video one more perfect one more time. So you see here how there's that slow phase up and then beating down. So we're calling this downbeat nystagmus. And then what you might appreciate, it's more subtle is, for example, when the patient's looking to the right, there's a little bit of a beating to the right as well. So a little bit of a gaze evoke. The main thing you're seeing now when the patient's looking straight ahead is a downbeat nystagmus. Now they're looking up and there's a little bit of upbeat, perhaps. And then here they're looking to the right. There's both a down and a right beat. So here we're, we're really showing predominantly downbeat nystagmus, and there's a bit of gaze evoked as well. So when the patient's looking in different directions, there's a, a, second, a second process going on. There's a bit of right beat on right gaze, left beat on up gaze, maybe a little bit of up beat on, on, on up gaze. So we can move to the next slide. So we saw, just as we saw in that video, downbeat nystagmus, there was gaze evoked as well. Um, and then the patient also had a wide base gait uh, and was unable to do tandem. So the first two things that we see on the eye movement exam, um, these are classic uh, findings that's localized to the cerebellum. So nine times out of 10, you know, 95 times out of 100, when you see downbeat and gaze evoked nystagmus, this is going to be a cerebellar uh, problem, uh, particularly the uh, flocculus and the paraflocculus of the cerebellum. So these are cerebellar eye findings. Um, and then of course, a wide base gait, not being able to do tandem, um, you know, this, uh, there can be different causes, of course, of a wide base gait, but when you see that uh, in tandem or in, in um, 
along with an association with uh, cerebellar eye findings, of course, you're thinking uh, very likely there's going to be a cerebellar problem here. And so if we take what we saw in exam uh, and then uh, put it together with what we heard on the history, um, you know, we're really getting the flavor here that this patient has a progressive ataxia syndrome. They have progressive symptoms, you know, slowly progressive over years. They have downbeat nystagmus, which localizes to the cerebellum, specifically the flocculus and the paraflocculus. Um, and when we see a cerebellar syndrome and ataxia syndrome, uh, again, really helpful to think about the time course. So if we're seeing a patient with downbeat and uh, an ataxia that's very acute, we should be thinking about stroke uh, or an infectious process like a cerebellitis, uh, which is more common in a pediatric population. Um, if it's subacute, really the big process you want to think about is a perineoplastic cause. That's the thing that, that you really want to rule out. And there are multiple uh, antibodies, multiple different um, sort of inflammatory cerebellar processes that, that are associated with neoplasms. Um, another one, you know, when things are presenting quickly, of course, it's rare, uh, but there is a cerebellar variant of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So that's something that you, you definitely want to think about if things are moving really quickly. Um, and then in cases that are, are, are more chronic, uh, want to think about things like multiple systems atrophy, uh, genetic progressive ataxias, uh, SCA6 would be a good example of, that can cause sort of downbeat uh, as a big part of its presentation. Uh, Long-standing medication use, uh, so dilantin, um, phenytoin would be a big one, anticonvulsants, uh, lithium. Um, and then nutritional, really important to think about because these are reversible. Um, so to think about, could there be B12 deficiency, thiamine deficiency, uh, vitamin E deficiency, or one of the various um, genetic causes that can give you low, low vitamin E levels. Um, and then Wilson's disease or abnormal copper processing. Uh, Wilson's, of course, is treatable as well. Um, so something that, that you wouldn't want to miss and can, uh, in cases, cause a progressive ataxia syndrome. So one other etiology that we definitely wanted to bring up in this lecture because it's uh, new uh, is SCA27B. Uh, so this is one of the most recent uh, described SCAs, um, and it's caused by a repeat expansion, a deep intronic repeat uh, in the gene FGF14. Uh, and it's just in the last couple of years uh, emerged as one of the most common causes of unexplained uh, late onset ataxia, um, and especially unexplained uh, downbeat nystagmus. And we're, you know, there, there have been many patients in our clinic where, you know, for a long time, we haven't known why they have downbeat. We haven't been able to explain why they have a progressive ataxia. Uh, and quite a number of them are now turning out to have uh, SCA 27B. Um, so it's definitely something that, you know, is going to come up on, on board exams, you know, that's going to be um, out there and discussed a lot uh, among neurologists and, and neurology residents. So it's one that we definitely wanted to, to bring up and one to remember. Okay, moving on to case three. Um, this is a 50 year old female who presents with a three year history of dizziness and an imbalance with walking mainly on uneven surfaces and in the dark. Um, in addition, she has a pins and needles sensation in her feet. No other significant symptoms that she brings up. She has a chronic cough since her twenties that she attributed to allergies. On her exam, you find that she has horizontal gaze-evoked nystagmus. She has bilateral ketchup saccades on head and pulse test, like case one. And she has saccadic smooth pursuit and saccadic visually enhanced vestibular ocular reflex, which I'm going to talk about in the upcoming slides. She has a length-dependent sensory neuropathy with impaired sensation to pinprick up to about mid-shin. She has impaired proprioception and vibration testing on bilateral distal helix. And she has a positive Romberg sign, and she has this broad, broad-based ataxic gait. So, what is the visually enhanced VOR? I might just play this video. To test the VOR, the head is slowly rotated back and forth in each plane while the patient fixates on the examiner's nose. This is the visually enhanced VOR, and is a combination of both smooth pursuit and the VOR. For the head impulse test, the head is rapidly rotated at a high acceleration but small range, 
while the patient fixates on the examiner's nose. One looks for a corrective saccade at the end of the head movement as a sign of the VOR being abnormal. That's a normal head impulse test. So um, like the video showed, the visually enhanced VOR tests both pursuit function and the vestibular ocular reflex. So if both are abnormal, then the visually enhanced VOR will be choppy and psychotic. And then the head impulse test only tests the VOR, it only tests the vestibular ocular reflex. It does not test pursuit because you cannot test pursuit function at such high frequencies. So here is this patient's exam. Slowly turn your head to the right and left. Keep your eyes on the light. Keep your eyes on the light and turn your head to the left. Nice and slow. Keep going. Good. To the right. Keep your eyes on the light. A little bit faster to the left. The right same speed Get to the left same speed to the right so this video demonstrates very well how she had a, a very choppy pursuit and so she's he's doing the visually enhanced VOR so we're testing both pursuit and the vestibular ocular reflex so it's psychotic so both are abnormal and you can even see kind of a gaze of a gaze of oak nystagmus at the end of her gaze um, when she's all the way over here. I just Slowly turn show your head to the back. right and left. Keep yeah. your eyes on the light. So you can see a little bit Keep of a gaze of oak here. Turn your head to the left. Okay. Slowly. So summarizing this case, she had cerebellar signs. She had this gaze of oak nystagmus. She had this ataxic gait and this psychotic smooth pursuit. She had evidence of bilateral vestibular loss with um, bilateral catch-up saccades on the head impulse test, and she had this sensory neuropathy. She also complained of this chronic cough, and at this point, do we know if these are related or, or not? So she was diagnosed with CANVAS, which is cerebellar ataxia neuropathy and vestibular areflexia syndrome, and the chronic cough is related. These patients always present with a cough. So summarizing CANVAS presents in midlife around age 50, it's caused by um, a sporadic or autosomal recessive 5 nucleotide expansion in the RFC1 gene or the replication factor complex subunit 1 gene. The most common presentation is patients will present with progressive imbalance. So canvas, cerebellar ataxia, she had the psychotic smooth pursuit and ataxic gait. She had neuropathy, she had a length dependent sensory neuropathy. She complained of walking oscillopsia from her bilateral vestibular loss and she had vestibular areflexia. So she had the abnormal vestibular ocular reflex in that she had the bilateral catch-up saccades on her head impulse test. So canvas always presents with a chronic dry cough, which usually comes two to three decades before the neurologic symptoms emerge. It also can have autonomic symptoms of urinary incontinence, um, orthostatic hypotension, and on MRI of the brain, you'll see cerebellar atrophy of the anterior and dorsal cerebellar vermis. Thanks, Dr. Allen. So to summarize our cases, um, so case one, we had a case of bilateral vestibular loss. Uh, case two, we had a progressive downbeat nystagmus or cerebellar ataxia case. And case three, really, we had a combination of case one and case two. So we had a patient who had bilateral vestibular loss and cerebellar dysfunction and cerebellar eye findings. So case three is kind of a, a combination case. And you can appreciate how patients with canvas disease uh, have such a difficult time with balance. Um, you know, they have a sensory neuropathy, which can be impacting their balance. They have bilateral vestibular loss, which can be uh, impacting their balance. Uh, and then they have a cerebellopathy. Um, so really, patients with canvas uh, have, have a lot of trouble with balance uh, because it's a combination. It's a combination of bilateral loss as well as a cerebellar ataxia. So we want to give some 
take home points before we open things up to, to questions. Um, so I wanna really emphasize again, how balance requires the integration of vision, proprioception and vestibular function. Uh, and we've sort of shown how cases, you know, where different uh, difficulties that patients have in, in those areas um, are, are affected, you know, the final common pathway is that they have balanced dysfunction, but on history and on exam, we can really tease things out in terms of what, uh, what might be affected. Um, and some, you know, things that are really useful on, on history. Um, so, you know, to do a, a Romberg, we talked in our patients a lot about Romberg sign. Um, and so if balance worsens with eye closure, we want to think about a proprioceptive or vestibular contributor because we're taking vision out. We're not allowing the vision to you, uh, not allowing the patient to use vision uh, when they're when they're standing with their feet together, for example. So they're then depending on their proprioception and their vestibular sense. And so if they have problems with proprioception or with vestibular sense, uh, then their balance is going to worsen when they when they close their eyes. So Romberg, really useful sign at uh, sort of at the bedside or even on history to find out, you know, at night when they're going to the bathroom, uh, you know, are they having more difficulty in dark environments? Um, and then really asking about oscillopsia. So again, we're really, you know, emphasizing this over and over, but oscillopsia, that's the sort of illusory movement of a stationary object. The, the world, the patient is seeing the world, their visual world moving. And so if the oscillopsia is there mostly when they're, when they're sitting quietly, not moving their head, um, often you're going to be thinking about uh, it's the correlate of nystagmus. So when their eyes are making uh, sort of that movement, slow and fast phase, if it's a jerk nystagmus, you can understand how they're going to see the world moving, how their visual world is going to be moving. On the flip side, if the patient's having oscillopsia, if the world is moving or jumping, just like that video that, that Dr. Allen showed uh, of, the, of the patient waiting room, um, if they're moving around and the world's not steady, this is likely reflecting vestibular loss or specifically loss of their vestibular ocular reflex. Again, their vestibular system isn't able to move the eyes to compensate uh, for movements in the head. So oscillopsy, a really helpful question on, on history. Uh, and on exam, a couple things that are really useful, a couple skills to sort of think about um, and, and practice on, on all your patients, or at least those that present with balance dysfunction. Um, so the first is really the head impulse test. Very useful clinical test. Again, we're testing the VOR, particularly the high frequency VOR. We're asking the patient to fixate on, on, on an object, for example, fixate on the, on the examiner's nose, and we're moving, rotating the head quickly. And so in, in a sort of, when the peripheral vestibular system is working normally, when we move the head quickly, um, the eyes are gonna stay on the target. If there's peripheral loss, the eyes are gonna move off the target and you're gonna see a corrective saccade because that something in that pathway uh, normally, the, it's a problem in the vestibular system, uh, is going to give us difficulty with our head impulse testing. So we're going to see a catch-up saccade that points to vestibular dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Allen really well described head shaking or dynamic visual acuity. And so again, we're doing the same thing there. It's a little bit uh, of a different maneuver. We're moving the head back and forth um, while the patient is trying to read the Snellen chart. Uh, and a patient who has a normal peripheral vestibular system, uh, they're going to be able to, to read pretty close to where they're reading uh, normally. They might lose, you know, two lines, for example. Um, but a patient with bilateral vestibular loss might lose, you know, up to, as in, in our case, four, four lines, for example. Um, and then on exam, if you see downbeat nystagmus, uh, and gaze-evoked nystagmus, as we saw in, in our case example, um, you really want to think about there being a problem with the cerebellum. These are specifically cerebellar eye findings. So a couple do not miss diagnoses. So in the case of bilateral vestibular loss, uh, we want to think about ototoxicity, particularly gentamicin, uh, thiamine deficiency, particularly when there are other signs, example, you know, ophthalmoparesis, um, you know, or, or other things that are pointing towards a nutritional deficiency. Canvas, if you see bilateral loss and downbeat, um, you, and a chronic cough particularly, you want to think about canvas. 
Um, and then one other thing uh, that that's important to think about if you haven't found a cause for someone who has bilateral vestibular loss um, is to think about a prior bleed, for example, a prior subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, because uh, hemosiderin deposition uh, tends or, or has a propensity um, to track along the, the eighth cranial nerve. Um, and so you, there are cases of bilateral vestibular loss coming from, from superficial siderosis. Of course, that's something that, that you wouldn't want to miss. So another important reason to get an MRI um, in cases of bilateral vestibular loss. And then if you see downbeat nystagmus, if you see cerebellar dysfunction, um, you really wouldn't want to miss a perineoplastic cause if it's a subacute uh, presentation. Uh, all the vitamin deficiencies, particularly B12, vitamin E, and thiamine, uh, and Wilson's disease because it's uh, treatable as well. So we want to open it now to um, questions. Uh, and so we'll see uh, if anything trickles through in the in the q and I'm very happy to answer really any question. There's no question that's too... Uh, too basic or, or too complicated. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone everyone understood what, what we just went over. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can do that. I can uh, I can put a question to uh, to to Dr. Allen maybe. So um, you know if um, for example you have a, a you know a patient in patient in front of you and. Um, you know, you're you're doing the the head impulse test, and you know you're not you're not quite sure what you're seeing or whether you're seeing a, a refixation. Any strategies or helpful tips that you can think of for for someone maybe who hasn't done a lot of head impulses before, um, in terms of you know how to practice or 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 what they might be able to do. Um, that's a good question. Making sure that they're focusing on your nose. Um, not going in the same direction every time. So they're not kind of anticipating it. And I know a lot of people have questions about going from, from center to side or from side to center. And um, it doesn't matter if you go from center to side or side to center, but some people have preferences in regards to doing the head impulse test. And, and um, I don't know what your preference is, Dr. Berry, but um, I think maybe going from the center to the side, you can change the direction, but ultimately you can accomplish it either way. Yeah, great. So I like I like all those tips. Um, so I think really the the first thing, just as you said, really want to advantage yourself in terms of position, lighting, all those things. So as you know, Dr. Allen, in our in our clinic room at at Hopkins, like you know, we have this really really bright interrogation light that we put on the patient when we're looking at their eyes because we, you know, light helps so much. You know, we we lift the patient up if you're in a setting where you know maybe the patient is sitting, you want to sit down, get to their eye level. Um, I love kind of what you're saying about uh, being a bit unpredictable about the impulses. So if you keep doing an impulse to the left side, you know, the patient is going to learn. It's really amazing how much learning there is in, um, in things like vestibular uh, sense. So, you know, do an impulse to the left and then do one to the right. Um, and then it's a great question about should you start lateral and move center or start center and move lateral? Um, I always like to start lateral and move center. I think when when folks are learning how to do the head impulse for the first time, it's much easier to instinctually know where midline is. So if you start lateral and move midline, you know, you're not going to go too far. Um, and when you end in the center, you're bringing the patient uh, back to center. And so if they have a bit of gaze evoked nystagmus, you're not going to bring out the gaze evoked if you bring them back to center. So that that can be really helpful as well. Um, and then one last thing that that's always really helpful, you know, if you're in the ED doing a consult and you have someone who can help you out, um, you know, those first couple of times while you're doing a head impulse, if you can record it on a smartphone uh, and then play it back in slow motion, um, it can make it easier to see uh, as we often do in our videos that, that we publish to the web or in case reports, we will often play it in slow motion. So you can do that yourself um, when you're when you're on the wards or or doing consults. Record have someone record it while you're doing the impulse and then play it back in slow motion. So so great. Yeah, I agree, agree completely. We'll maybe go in 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 order. So a great question here. You know, if an older patient presents with a chronic cerebellar ataxia, uh, should we think about Wilson disease? 
I think, again, epidemiologically, it's going to be uh, less likely, uh, but there are cases. I think at least, you know, if there's uh, concern, if there's, uh, you know, I, I would definitely get a slit lamp uh, exam if there's any concern uh, whatsoever in terms of Wilson. Because it's such an easy lab test um, to get at least the screening seriloplasm, uh, seriloplasmin, I mean, it is on our, our screening for, for ataxia, again, because it's not something that we wouldn't want to miss. Um, and sort of in our clinic, we do have uh, folks who are trained in the slit lamp and are ophthalmologists. So they will, they, they you know, we, we tend to use the slit lamp as a matter of course. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go directly to to something uh, less convenient like a like a twenty four hour uh, urine copper, uh, but I think a screening test, you know, it is on our basic blood work, um, just because it is something that that you wouldn't want to miss. But again, sort of in an older patient where where there aren't other signs, where you know things are really looking just like a a chronic cerebellar ataxia, I think it's it's less likely, but something that you wouldn't you wouldn't want to miss. Uh, so next question, you know, not really about the the discussed diagnoses, but but triple PD, uh, you know, what what's the optimal treatment? Um, again, we could do a whole lecture on on triple PD. Hopefully, at some point, we'll we'll have the opportunity to do that. Uh, but I don't know, Doctor Allen, if if you maybe want to give a a few pearls about three um, PD and and how we how we approach it just as a basic sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, triple PD. Uh, optimal treatment is is basically having them relearn their vestibular system, their vestibular system, having them turn and move. So a lot of things we recommend is having them go dancing, play ping pong, things that they're constantly turning their head and they're relearning um, how to use their vestibular symptom, vestibular system, because these patients had some prior vestibular injury and now you know they are very visually sensitive. So retraining them um, to be accustomed to vestibular stimuli. Um, also like vestibular physical therapy is really good for these patients. But we always recommend dancing, turning, playing ping pong, things with hand-eye coordination. Um, and there's also videos that they can watch too to train themselves. Um, like them, YouTube videos of people walking through a grocery store of, um, of people on a roller coaster and that they can watch and, and slowly you know gain that that function back those are the main things um other things we can do for triple pd is prescribe something like an ssri or something like amitriptyline to kind of um, be that chemical boost for them to be motivated to try um these therapies because they're typically you know very hesitant and have been um and have you know a lot of difficulty and struggle through these exercises. So um, a very short course of an SSRI. And Dr. Barry, I don't know if you have anything to to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, that that was a great answer. I think I I think about it in terms of um, sort of you know biopsychosocial or you know conservative medical um, sort of rehab. But I think you hit all the all the items there. Uh, you know, I think ex explaining the diagnosis uh, is, is of, of high value. So when you're, you know, when you've done sort of a good exam, you know, in our case, obviously, we have vestibular testing, we've sort of uh, identified that there's not an ongoing sort of underlying vestibular. Now, there may well have been a contributor, but there's nothing active um, that they've sort of, as you say, become more visually sensitive. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of value in the diagnosis sort of conservative things, you know, as you say, rehab can be really helpful, medical, uh, you know, medications, uh, particularly the older migraine type medications like, like TCAs um, tend to help just give a little bit of the neurochemical boost, you know, and then it's, uh, work, you know, work on, on behalf of the, of the patient, you know, in terms of finding activities that they like that are going to integrate vision vestibular. Um, so just as you said, ping pong, um, dancing, things where you have a lot of angular movement, um, you know, no strong evidence, but, you know, we find anecdotally that that, that, that helps, helps patients a lot. So yeah, great, great answer, Dr. Allen. Uh, so the next question is, is there a way to screen for the nucleotide uh, repeat diseases? So this is a really, really good question. 
Um, we have a specific ataxia clinic where we tend to see a lot of our downbeat cases. Um, and the genetics does get complicated. It gets you know, complicated in terms of what you're going to order. It gets complicated in terms of funding. Um, and so, you know, the way we do things is we have a stepped model. And so if we're, you know, we see a patient with a, an ataxia that's sort of more subacute to chronic, we've sort of eliminated uh, sort of a first line workup, nutritional things, some of the other things that we, inflammatory things that we talked about. Um, then typically we'll send a first panel, which is a screening panel, uh, this often involves some of the more common spinocerebellar ataxias. Um, but the repeat diseases, particularly the two that we talked about in uh, sort of in our presentation today, uh, Canvas as well as um, the, the very new one, SCA27B, um, these aren't on the, the standard panel. So we specifically have to request them. Um, and my understanding is that um, it, you know, it's it's di more difficult to screen for them specifically. You, you need to know uh, the gene in particular that you're that you're looking for. Um, and as far as I'm aware, even on a whole exome, you wouldn't necessarily pick up uh, these specific repeats. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, you know, at least as far as whole exomes go in the in the U.S., um, it wouldn't necessarily pick up Canvas or uh, or Scott twenty seven B. But that's a great question. So the next question is, uh, in a patient with symptoms of BPPV, uh, but no nystagmus uh, on Dix-Hallpike, um, would, uh, I think what they mean is, would repositioning be helpful bilaterally, uh, specifically regarding the um, Epley maneuver? Uh, Dr. Allen, I don't know if you want to take a crack at this one. Um, so I'm guessing... I don't know if they have a diagnosis of BPPV then, if they have no clear nystagmus on um, Dick's Hall Pike. So I'm not sure how beneficial they would be if they just have symptoms, but there's no nystagmus. Um, I, I guess my, my question would be how was the diagnosis of BPPV made or did they ever have nystagmus on these testing? But I would start to think about other diagnoses as well. Um, so I'm not sure. What do, you, what do you think about that, Dr. Berry? Yeah, yeah, great. That's exactly uh, what I was going to get at. And so, you know, in in most cases of BPPV, to be confident in, in your diagnosis, um, you want to have both the symptoms and the signs. Uh, of course, we didn't talk about BPPV um, today, but what we're talking about is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, and what we're talking about is sort of dislodged uh, debris inside the semicircular canals uh, that produce dizziness, produce vertigo when the head is moved in specific positions. So in history, you want to hear that specific head movement and specifically the head rather than just the body um, are going to give you sort of short episodes of intense vertigo. Um, at least initially when, when uh, the symptoms come on, it's, it should be a clear history. Um, and then when you go and sort of test the patient and you do a, a Dix Hallpike maneuver, um, you're gonna you really want to see those symptoms and signs. So you want to see uh, symptoms, short, intense vertigo with movement of the head, and you want to see the signs. You want to see the the corresponding nystagmus as well. Now there are cases, you know, particularly if the sort of BPPV is a little bit less severe, or perhaps if the patient's had it for a long time. Uh, or if the pa patient is using uh, fixation to suppress their nystagmus a little bit, you know, it is a little bit controversial, but there's this entity called um, sort of um, sym symptoms of, of BPPV um, where, where you're not seeing the, the nystagmus or, or, or BPPV without nystagmus. You know, I would say in those cases, you want to be really sure that, you know, it's head movements that are bringing on the symptoms um, that specifically it's happening when you're maximally stimulating one canal. In the case of a dix pike, it would be the sort of posterior canal. And particularly if the symptom is coming on bilaterally um, and you're not seeing any nystagmus and you've never documented nystagmus on testing before, um, you really want to ask the question, is there something else that can be going on? So to tie it back sort of to our presentation, you know, there is an entity called positional downbeat nystagmus. Um, which is associated with cerebellar findings, associated with cerebellar 
uh, findings. Uh, and in central positional nystagmus, you know, what, what you're going to see is, for example, downbeat nystagmus when you bring the patient back. And so the patient can be symptomatic when they lie down. It's often not as severe as, you know, certainly not acute BPPV, um, but you want to look carefully. Is there a bit of downbeat when the patient lies down? Is there another reason uh, for them to have sort of positional nystagmus? But I would say if you're really not seeing any nystagmus on either side, um, just as you said, Dr. Allen, I would be sort of questioning the diagnosis of BPPV. I would be thinking about other things first. Um, I would, you know, check carefully, is it possible they have horizontal uh, canal BPPV? So to do, a, again, it was out of the scope of today's uh, presentation, but, but to look, could there be um, some stones in the horizontal canal? Uh, could there be something else that, that's going on uh, if they're having symptoms bilaterally and, and no nystagmus? Um, no nystagmus whatsoever. Great. So I see we have five minutes. Maybe, uh, Dr. Allen, we can just do one or two of the check your understanding questions to sort of wrap wrap things up. And if any last minute burning questions come in, we can we can also answer those. So this is our. Uh, we put a couple of check your understanding questions together. Um, so this question is: walking oscillopsia or bouncing a vision with movement uh, is a sign of what? Uh, so take a moment to read through the answers and come up with the one, the one that you think fits best. Okay, I think we can re reveal the answer now. Right, so, you know, again, walking oscillopsia, it's a reflection of vestibular loss. Again, the, the VOR isn't working, the eyes aren't staying on the target when the head is being moved. Um, and it's most classically when it when it comes as a symptom when patients are describing it most classically with bilateral loss. Um, you know, unilateral loss wouldn't wouldn't be wrong in and of itself. But usually, patients who have loss on one side, um, the other side can compensate, um, and they sort of learn and can use the other side. Um, so the best answer here is bilateral vestibular loss, just like in our our case one. Um, the patient who, you know, walking through the waiting room uh, and, and the world is moving, so they're having walking oscillopsia. So question two, a patient with canvas uh, may present with all of the following except. So take a minute to look through the answers and we'll, we'll reveal. Okay, I think we can reveal the answer now. So unilateral hearing loss is the one that isn't classically associated with canvas. So of course, canvas is, um, you know, the, the classic things that you're going to find are a cerebellar ataxia, uh, vestibular loss, uh, as well as neuropathy. So a neuropathy is covered. It's a classic symptom. The chronic cough, we've, we see that in pretty much every patient with canvas to the point where, you know, if we don't see a chronic cough, we're thinking much less about uh, canvas. Uh, walking oscillopsia, you'd see on the basis of bilateral vestibular loss. Um, and then they have an ataxic gait uh, for a number of reasons. It could be from the neuropathy, uh, it could be from the uh, vestibular loss. Uh, and then, of course, they have an ataxia as well if they have cerebellar dysfunction. So um, so the one that doesn't fit is the unilateral loss, uh, unilateral hearing loss, I'm sorry. Um, so we have another great question, which is in bilateral vestibular loss, do we expect the symptoms to be intermittent uh, or to be constant? So if we're talking about the sort of walking oscillopsia, the difficulty, uh, you know, keeping their, their eye steady, you know, that symptom is going to be there as long as they're in an environment where, where they're taxing that system. So if they're walking on a bumpy road or driving, you know, and it's a, there's a lot of movement and they're trying to read a sign, you know, for as long as they're doing that movement, they're going to have that symptom of oscillopsia. Similarly, when they're walking around, depending a lot on their balance, uh, you know, they're going to have challenges um, most of the time. Our typical experience is that patients who have bilateral vestibular loss that's come on slowly, uh, our, our usual experience is that, you know, they're not going to have a lot of dizziness and it's going to be more these other symptoms of imbalance. So I would say as long as they're taxing their vestibular system, uh, they're going to have symptoms. But if they're sitting quietly, um, you know, they, they, they may be doing okay. Okay, great. Well, that concludes 
you know, our piece. Uh, and uh, it looks like we've sort of addressed all the questions. Uh, so maybe we'll we'll turn it over to Ben for sort of a final final conclusion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry and Dr. Allen, for being here. Uh, really appreciate the time. Thank you, everyone, for asking questions. Uh, you can find all of these on our AAN's YouTube channel. I also post a link in the chat where we host on AAN.com. And uh, we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everyone.